Okay, guys, welcome back. Um, as you know, uh, your color schemes were due last uh, last night. I see a lot of you have already turned those in. That's great. Some of you have not. It, it will remain open for a week uh, to turn in late work. Um, just a couple of things I want to cover before we move forward on this next assignment. Uh, as we progress through the weeks now, because this is week four, week four, five, six, and seven, we're going to start covering different types of underpaintings. Um, the next one that we're going to cover is called an imprimatura, and its its root word is Italian, uh, and it means to print. Uh, and this is basically a stage where you take a drawing, uh, draw on the canvas, fix it to the canvas, and then paint with paint, one color, um, the painting values quickly and established in one sitting. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to make it clear that this is not a drawing class, um, but there are ways that you can transfer images down without having to freehand the image or be... Uh, you know, experience with drawing from life. Uh, I've been drawing for, from life for a long time. I sometimes use a grid to transfer images on my landscapes to the canvas. It just depends on what mood I'm in is, you know, maybe I'm, I just want to get to the painting side of things. I might throw it in an opaque projector. Uh, I, I use whatever I can at, at my disposal to make the process a little bit more enjoyable. And with that being said, there are multiple ways that you can transfer a drawing, or a photograph to a canvas. The best and easy way is the grid way. And I'm going to be posting videos uh, just below this one on how to grid your drawing and draw it out. Essentially, you basically grid the drawing, or you grid your drawing, you grid your painting, and you enlarge it to the painting with the same amount of squares. And it's important that each one is, is a square, that each grid is, is square and not rectangles and the ratio of one to one from a square, because a square is a one to one to make the square, is that that ratio stays intact as you move over to your canvas. And essentially, you can enlarge any, any photograph you want to the canvas size that you're painting on, which I think in this case is 11 by 17. I'm going to be posting that video on YouTube. I haven't made a grid video yet, just because I've been inundated with process videos and making videos now for all of my other studio classes that are online anytime. So I'm stuck making videos on Mondays all day long. Um, option. I, if you're comfortable freehanding drawing the, the image to your, uh, your canvas, by all means. Uh, this is not a drawing class. I'm not going to grade you on the drawing. The painting process is what it, it's all about. So and for me, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be using the imprimatura method which is basically making a wash and drawing your under, covering up your underdrawing. And you don't have to do an underdrawing for this side of things. Uh, you could simply just start painting on, onto your canvas and looking at the object and drawing from it or looking at a photograph and painting from it, however you choose to do it. The purpose of an underpainting is to switch it from a drawing to a painting aspect. And there are multiple colors you could use. It doesn't really matter. Most of the time, I use a burnt umber or earthy color. Just because earth tones are cheap, they're made from dirt or rust or clay, which is readily available as opposed to something like a cadmium yellow or a cadmium orange or a cadmium red, which is super expensive. I would never do an underpainting uh, technique with one of these cad colors or expensive tubes of paint. Not to mention that, but browns dry quick. Uh, I put a little bit of my, my liquid in there, mix it in and start painting with it. Uh, it'll dry by tomorrow. Uh, and right now, I've already drawn out my drawing. Uh, I'm going to switch over real quick to my drawing. So I'm going to switch over. So right here is Blair Max Spray Fixative. It's a little bit different than the, the brand that I had you guys get. This is just what I have. Um, I get this from Dick Blick as well. Uh, any of the spray fixatives will work, but the purpose is to evenly coat a protective layer over your drawing, okay? And 
you want to spray it at least four to six inches away from your drawing and try to coat the entire drawing surface. If you miss something, you could lose the drawing uh, in portions. So a, four to six inches away from the painting, uh, from the drawing, excuse me, and uh, just give it a nice light spray coat and let it dry outside. You don't ever really want to spray this inside. So once you get your drawing done and you spray it, you always want to make sure that you spray your, your drawing because uh, when you add solvent to your canvas, which you're going to thin your, your paint out with, with terpenoid, is you run the risk of erasing all the marks that you've just drawn down. And there's nothing worse than learning uh, by the worst possible example you can do. And believe me, it's, it's happened to me more than one time where I forget to spray my, my drawing I go to do this imprimatura or, you know, my underpainting and all of my drawing is gone and there's nothing that can bring it back. Um, there's no coming back from that unless you go back in and physically draw it all over again, which is what I had to do. And it's a hard lesson to learn, but you only have to do it once. Uh, you make that mistake once and you remember never to do it again. And when you use solvents, it's going to erase your marks. So spraying your drawing prior to and letting it dry completely prior to painting over it and oils is going to it's going to ensure that it, it stays intact and you're going to be able to see that drawing uh, so I want to take a little moment and, and show you my reference here I think I've already done that I have not so I'm, I'm going to show you my reference here real quick and it's nothing fancy <clears throat> Here is my reference, and I made it into a black and white version as well. Uh, so that's basically what I used for my reference. And once I've got it all drawn out, I'll show you that here in a minute. There, I've got my painting behind me, and there's a couple things that I want to remind you of. Okay, One, the technique that I'm going to use today is called an imprimatura, and essentially it is just a preliminary drawing that's been turned into a painting. Uh, details are not really focused on. I'm going to get the gist of it down pretty quick. I'm going to cover the entire canvas, but more importantly, one, you want to make sure that you're adding the, your liquid to whatever color you choose. Now, I'm going to be using an earth tone, probably burnt umber, because I like it. It's cheap. Umber is really cheap. It's like $7 a tube, uh, and it, they're readily available just about in any color uh, manufacturer there is. I'm going to use an earth tone. It dries quick. It's cheap, but no matter what color you use, you want to always make sure you're adding liquid to the main mix. And then you're diluting it with your solvent. Now, I'm not going to dilute it with dirty solvent. I'm going to use a clean solvent, uh, meaning that it's not from like my, my... I mean, if you're not worried about it, your, your, your solvent from your jar is going to work fine. Uh, but it doesn't really matter in this stage because I want it to be kind of muddy. I don't want it to be resemble of any color. I'm just trying to establish value. So I'm going to show you to you real quick. And here it is. There is the drawing, that, uh, and it's sprayed. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to coat this thing. And unfortunately, I do not have, hey. unfortunately, I do not have a capture card to do a picture in picture. So I might just record this guy um, without you showing, it, without you seeing my palette. I don't know what happened to one of my capture cards for a separate shot. Uh, but I've already ordered one today. It should be in tomorrow. So new videos will all have that. And some of the videos that I posted from last semester do have that in there. Uh, but I should get that resolved. I just don't know what happened to it. It's $20 off of Amazon for an HD capture card. Uh, this camera is a little bit better with the capture card that I'm firing off now. Uh, but I should have that resolved. So aside from that. But one, add liquid. Two, use your terpenoid to thin it. Do not use water. Ever. <laughs> uh, water and oil don't mix and you're going to end up with a pretty bad, nasty gum. And uh, I'm going to try to shift my camera uh, just so that you can see what I'm doing first. And uh, I'll voice over it to edit in so that you can see what I'm doing. And to produce values, I just want you to know, okay, so to produce a different value from one color, it's all dependent upon how thin it gets. Think about this wash layer as essentially like a watercolor, where when you just add liquid, to, you, add, you put your tube on your palette, you add a little bit of liquid, that is your darkest value right there without any dilution, okay? And as you add more solvent, it's going to become more and more like a watercolor where it's going to get thinner and appear to be 
lighter in value, even though it's not. You're just allowing more of the white of the canvas to come through, and that's what makes it appear to be wider. So with that being said, I'm going to now switch over to my canvas, and we're going to start painting this thing. So I'm going to do my best to add voiceover while I'm doing this so that it just sounds like you know I'm working naturally, because I hate when I do voiceovers and it doesn't sound connected to the video. So right now I've got my color, which is Burnt Umber by Gamblin. It's really cheap. It's like 6 $7 a tube. And I've got my glass palette. Uh, I'm definitely going to be using some liquid. Palette knife. It's like a, it's a trusty number one. So I've got my liquid here, right here. Um, and I'm going to put down some umber. It's not going to take much for this small painting. Again, you can use whatever color you want. Uh, brown is just what I like and prefer just because it's cheap and it dries fast. Sorry if I stood in front of that. Um, I just added some, just like a little, it's about maybe a two pea sizes. And I'm going to go ahead and mix this in with my liquid, which is about maybe one pea size. So it's basically a, a mixture of two paint to one liquid. And it's going to change the consistency a little bit, but you can kind of see that. I'll just go ahead and add a little more. Uh, it's, it's about two to one of paint to liquid. Uh, so this will definitely dry by tomorrow. Um, but you can clearly see that it's not completely uh, transparent to the point where it's like a glaze yet, which we'll talk about that later. It might look pretty black on camera. It's pr you can really see it in there. It's like a, it's almost like a warm red brown. Um, but it's more brown than red. It just has a tin, like a tinge of, of brown. So I do have a bottle of Gamsol, which is uh, Gamblin's version of Terpenoid. It's the same thing that you guys have. Uh, I, just ha I just had the bottle. Uh, it doesn't matter. I use whatever I've got. But this is Terpenoid. It's just Gamsol, which is like Gamblin's solvent. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to squeeze some out and put some on my palette. Now, if you have to dip your brush into your jar and then bring it up, I, I'm just going to give you guys a quick example here of how I'm using this. Sorry, I'm stepping in front of it. Um, the camera, this is not my ideal camera setup. So I'm just going to grab a little bit of paint. And then you can see that by mixing in solvent, I can, by adding more solvent, I can create a very, very thin kind of wash and you can see that as it gets thicker if I just put a little bit of this down right next to it you can see that the more solvent you add the thinner it gets so I'm gonna I'm gonna change it's it's a very simple concept as a wash uh, because you actually can see the white this is painted gray underneath it and you can see that as the light goes through it it gets darker the more opaque it is and it just appears darker so there's nothing, there's no secret. It's one, it, I'm not lying to you guys. It is one thing of paint. So there's a couple of things that I'd like to bring up uh, as this is kind of going through the motions. Um, one, I'm going to use a couple of brushes. Right now, it's basically just a square, one inch wide. Uh, I'm going to switch over here in a minute to a mop, which is an optional brush. It's very similar to a lady's foundational makeup brush. Uh, it's basically used to eliminate brush strokes. Uh, uh, and I'm also going to show you my my little setup here in my studio on, uh, you know, basically, here's that mop brush. It's basically just a very soft brush that I'm lightly touching the canvas with. But I'm going to fade out here and I'm going to zoom out here and uh, you're going to see my setup and what how I paint. Right now I'm just trying to establish the light coming from the upper right and going to the shadows going down to the left so I just want that excuse me that corner a little bit darker here's my little setup I've got an iPad over to the left that allows me to zoom in and look at details as I paint the object this is called a mall stick uh, you can rig it up however you want it basically just hangs off of those little pegs like that right there uh, it just hangs down and that allows me to rest my hand on the stick uh, so that I don't put my pan down on the wet paint so that's pretty much what I'm putting my hand on the entire time this video so a couple of, of quick just safe safe um, practices when it comes to painting uh, oils are toxic you don't really want to get a whole bunch of oil on your hand or solvent on your hand uh, I'm not wearing gloves just because 
Uh, I've tried to wear gloves in the past, for especially this stage, and I don't like having the, the latex layer between my skin and the brush as well as the feel of how it pulls. It just affects me. So I try to keep my hands very clean while I paint. Uh, yes, there are some more toxic uh, colors. Uh, as soon as I get paint on my hands, of like cadmiums and heavy metals, uh, pigments that you know you can look up the periodic table and what are heavy metals. Uh, cadmium is one of them. Uh, so like cadmium yellow, orange, and red. These are heavy metal colors that are that are cooked to create the certain color that you get in a tube of paint. Uh, it's just best to have good practice. Don't put your brushes in your mouth. Don't eat the paint. Uh, and definitely don't let uh, solvent stay on your hands. I wash my hands off camera that you don't see uh, multiple times in this video. Uh, and that's usually when it jumps because I forget to hit pause, uh, unpause uh, when I come back and it kind of jumps and I notice it. But a uh, good, good rule of thumb is just keep your hands clean and, uh, you know, be safe. Uh, it's always good uh, after each session to clean your brushes um, just so you don't have paint dry up in your brush. I mean, you're going to spend money on brushes and it's just foolish to not clean your brushes uh, as you you know finish a day's painting. Clean it off, clean them out, dry out uh, the, the brush as much as possible after you, you know, clean it in your solvent and uh, keep your solvent as clean as possible, you know, especially after a few sessions of painting, it gets pretty dirty. Uh, this will also uh, extend the life of your brush. I never throw brushes out though. Even a bad brush has a purpose. So I usually keep all of my brushes and I have a ton of them. But as I go through this video, I mean, I'm just kind of following that reference off to the right there. I try to make it as, as big as possible and as close to the image as possible. But I'm also looking at my little Pez dispenser down there on the right. You can see that some information uh, in the reference over there on the, the right side, the black and white image. Uh, I'm going to probably, I'm going to try to do my best to come back in and add the Pez sign. You can see it in the actual Pez dispenser on the orange next to my painting where it says Pez. I'm going to try to come back and, and hit that up. I've got the, the a little reminder there for me uh, in my ticks there on, on in the painting. You can see where the shadows lie where it says Pez there. But uh, Roughly, I'm just adding, it's best to add thin and just build up the color and the, the amount of value rather than adding a bunch first and having to wipe it out. Uh, the, the key is just to go slow and let it build up and, and adjust accordingly. And if something needs to be darkened, add a little bit more. And eventually you'll come up with your own little system of how to apply the paint to where it goes down relatively simply. Uh, I've done this many times and I believe me, I know how to do this. Uh, for the highlights, what I wiped out, that's just me removing uh, paint from the entire canvas. So that's the white of the canvas. That's not white paint. There's no white paint in this at all. Uh, I used I use a Q-tip, just kind of wipe that out. Um, and, and that little, you can see part of the drawing in there. Uh, of the, the, concentric, con, the concentric ring inside the highlight there. And I'm, I soften it up a little. Uh, but even, it's still there even in the end product. Uh, I didn't like the image in the background of the, the photo, so I'm just going to add a, a nice little horizon line and kind of fade it out. But uh, that's pretty much it, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, always practice safe and keep those brushes clean because, you know, they're not cheap. And, uh, you know, they'll last you a lifetime if you take care of them. guys well that is the imprimatura uh, approach uh, it is the most basic we're going to do one that's a little bit similar in a landscape where we study textures but uh, it's the most basic setup uh, and it's kind of very similar to drawing uh, in the sense that it's brown and you kind of just kind of uh, get used to thinning the paint to create your values uh, it's done behind me i did it all in one day it took about two hours two and a half hours to do it but i also was filming uh, so it took me on that size which is about I think that one's eight by 10 uh, for that one. Uh, and yours is about a th 11 by 17, I think. 
Uh, so it's not that much bigger. Uh, it shouldn't take you longer than two hours to do three hours. You absolutely can get it done in a day. You should get it done in a day. Um, uh, but you know, the more you do this, the easier it's going to become. You're going to learn a lot by thinning the paint and, you know, longer strokes. You got to make a little bit thinner, but you can't make it too thin to where it drips. Uh, these are all things that you just have to learn on your own and go through the motions on how to learn how to, uh, you know, control the paint. Uh, cause that's basically what we're here to do is learn how to control the paint. Uh, we will continue on next week with a grisaille, which is a little bit more controlled underpainting. It's a little bit more tedious. So uh, I will tell you that uh, based off of the calendar, uh, which I'm looking at right now, I can't share it because I'm shooting this in a different program because I had to do multiple things. Uh, on the next painting, you need to find two objects that you're going to be painting. Uh, that you want to paint small or a piece of fruit or a vegetable, but two objects that you will want to paint. Uh, so this one had one in it next week. You're going to need two. So if you want to get ahead of the curve, your next project is going to be two uh, objects instead of one. And it can't be the same one as this one. Uh, but the next one is called a grisaille. Uh, if you are familiar with Italian, uh, grisaille is gray. Uh, so it'll be done in a gray scale. So Keep that in mind. Uh, and if you look at your calendar, there are dates in there uh, that will tell you when you need to find things, like the next painting. Uh, I will tell you right now, you need to find a landscape. Uh, it's better to take that photograph yourself, and when you're driving around, just look for a field or something. Uh, it's better to photograph it yourself. Um, you can also find it online for the landscape, but that's in uh, the 22nd. Uh, so you don't really need to worry about that right now. I'll remind you about that when we're doing the grisaille. The imprimatura, uh, which is this pro process, you need to have the drawing done at least by Wednesday. That way you can have, uh, it needs to be done by Wednesday night. That way on Thursday and Friday and Saturday, you can work on the painting aspect of it. Uh, it says due on Thursday, but you need to have it done on Wednesday. So uh, I, I, I might move that around and adjust the calendar for that. But, uh, you know, if you're watching this video, to the end, you'll, you'll, you should understand that it's due on Wednesday. And I'm going to add that to the Blackboard uh, assignment right now. So that's the impro imprim Imprimatura uh, approach. It's very simple, and uh, most people love this one. Um, and, and it can be combined with any of the other processes, if you'd like. Uh, we'll cover that on a little bit closer towards... Uh, a little bit closer towards uh, spring break, uh, I'll, I'll talk about using multiple underpaintings uh, for your first layer. So, all right, first and second layer. Uh, so, if you have any questions, shoot me an email. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, this will be on my YouTube channel, so if you want to follow me, I'm just now getting it going, but you can see that I have the setup, and uh, I will be posting more and more videos related to art, including, like, making canvases and going out on site and photoshopping and things like that. So uh, I know it's probably slow going because these are taking up all my time for the class, but uh, I will be posting videos periodically. So if you have any questions, just shoot me an email, guys. Uh, my website is longtonart.com. You can shoot me an email through there. I'm still working on the email. I don't know if it's working yet for my email list, but uh, by all means, join the email list uh, and I will get that uh, secrets out of creating depth in your painting but we, we're going to cover that in class so all right guys have a good one and i'll see you next time